Amen. Thanks, Daniel. Love for you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 47. And if you did not bring a Bible with you, there should be Bibles in the seats underneath you in front of you there. And you can take one of those Bibles out. And as we say every week, if you do not have a Bible or if you know someone that needs a Bible, take one of those. And that is our gift to you or them. And we encourage you to do so. Isaiah 47, seeing our eyes, seeing our world through the eyes of faith. When we look at chapter 47 today, we're going to look at the account again of the fall of Babylon, and we're going to look at it in a prophetic perspective. And as we do, we, we need to look at this and all things with an eye of faith. Faith is the eyesight of of the soul by which we can see invisible realms realms that that cannot be proved or or described in any scientific endeavor but there is as scripture says all around us all the time a spiritual realm it exerts a tremendous force upon us it's kind of like this magnetic force force on our souls at all times and its source of good and evil right that that source of good and evil and it can only be perceived by faith by the ministry of the word of God by the reading of scripture we have our eyes open to this realm that's around us and know it and we are under this gravitational pull all the time of these the spiritual realm we cannot see into the invisible realm apart by faith but by faith we know that there's a god we know there's a god who sits on the throne of light a god who dwells in an unapproachable light that we cannot even begin to fathom or see right now we know there's holy angels that what do they do they cover their faces as they serve him and what do they do what do they sing when they're around him they cry holy 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 and even beyond these invisible spiritual beings to us then there is what we need to acknowledge as dark evil forces fallen angels commonly called demons devils and it is an organized system of evil it is not random it is organized and it's awful the system of evil is ruled by satan himself and together these demons, fallen angels, make up this dark kingdom with Satan. And in some places in Scripture, it's spoken of in, in these words, rulers, authorities of this present darkness. And in mysterious and immeasurable ways, the devil and his angels are in charge of what? This world. They're in charge of this world right now. They orchestrate his world system that surrounds us all the time. That's why scripture says that as Christians, we are strangers. We are foreigners in this land. And this dark force that's there draws each person on earth into patterns of rebellion. And who is the rebellion against? God. Satan is known as the God of this age, the ruler of the power of air. During the temptation of Jesus Christ, he, he, Satan, took Jesus high on a mountain, showed him in an instant what? All of the kingdoms of this world. And he said, I, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, Jesus, it'll all be yours. And of course, Jesus refused and he said, what? No, he said, away from me, Satan. He said, away from me. He attacked Satan's twisted version of scripture, 
with a true version of Scripture. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. And I say all of that today, everyone, that Satan certainly today makes lesser forms of that same offer to everyone present, to all of the leaders of the world right now, to the movers and the shakers of this world. He says, hey, bow down to me. Worship me. And I will, give you, I will give you sections of the world to rule. I think sometimes for people that are Christians, sometimes it just gets, I don't know how to say this, we just get beat down with living in this world, don't we? Sometimes you just like, oh, good grief, here we go again. Just what, whatever it may be. And I think there's times where somehow maybe there's churches that accidentally teach this or maybe they teach it uh, purposely and, it, and it's wrong, but there's this feeling like, well, hold it, shouldn't Christians be in charge of this world? And it's, no, that's, that's, this isn't our home. This isn't our home. We're on a mission in this world. We are on an incredibly cool mission. But man, you feel beaten down in that mission. Because Satan is, is a bitter enemy to Christ, and if you call yourself one of his children, and if you are one of his children... He's going to attack you. And he will continually attack you with everything he's got. Even though we know in Scripture that those who are God's children cannot be snatched away. Satan doesn't care. He wants to make your life miserable. And so many times people get into this mindset, I... I can't I just love the world a little bit? Can't, can't I just love some of the stuff? And you got to hear me outright on this. It's not that we look at God's incredible creation and so, oh, that's terrible. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the fact that if God has blessed you with resources, that, that you aren't supposed to have resources. We're not talking about that. But what we are talking about is the love of that over God. 1 John 2, verse 15, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. So we are, we're warned, right? The dark forces of this world are, are, are powerful and they zip you in. Even this time of year in Christmas when we're worshiping the first advent, the first coming of our Lord and Savior Satan's out to think to get us to not think about that and think about everything else. And so what I want to do today is take a look at Isaiah 47 over the next few minutes here. Take a look as the people of God. And if you are not a Christian here today, you can start to sense, okay, this is how these people think. And this is how it's different. For those who are Christians. So I want you to take a listen to this if you're not a believer and understand what God is saying here as much as you can. Because there's a word of warning here in Isaiah 47 
about what the world's going to end up doing. And then there is an incredible, incredible encouragement that's embedded in this section as well. So let's dive in. If you have your Bible open, it's chapter 47, verse 1. I'm just going to read the first four verses and see what this says. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and and grind meal. Remove your veil, strip off the skirt, uncover the leg, cross the rivers. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame will be exposed. I will take vengeance and will not spare a man. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name, the Holy One of Israel. The virgin daughter of Babylon is really properly pictured here as a pampered, enthroned daughter of the king, so to speak. A virgin daughter image is used actually frequently in the Bible to refer to what is most delicate and precious in the culture, the young women, the young girls. And they're frequently portrayed in various prophecies as taking tambourines and other pieces of musical instruments and going out and celebrating victory and celebrating military victories. Like when the Philistines would win or something like that, the daughters of the Philistines would go out and celebrate. Same thing for the daughter of Zion, who does the same thing, celebrating when the Jewish people win a victory, the the. This kind of thing is the picture there. So here we have the the virgin daughter of Babylon pictured as pampered and throned, sitting on top of the world. And you know what? Have you ever met someone that's a little pampered and sitting on top of the world? And what tends to go with that? A little bit of arrogance, maybe a lot of arrogance, a lot of pride. And, you know, and, and she's like, well, you know, I'm protected. But suddenly, as we see here in these verses, suddenly that time comes to an end. It's done. She loses her position of power in the first sentence. She's thrown down from the throne of luxury, and she's commanded to sit where? In the dust. Sit in the dust. And that was so humiliating. We even see pictures of this throughout history. When royalty went through the city, were they walking on the path? Were they walking in the dust? No. They were held up on high, weren't they? And in this case, we see all of a sudden, boom, humiliation. She's she's never, according to scripture here, really never going to be called tender, delicate again. Going to develop calluses on her hands. She's going to be doing menial labor, grind flour, going out to get water, having to lift up her skirt to wade through the streams and get water. She's basically enslaved. She's going to be humiliated into hard labor. She's going to be stripped of all dignity, humiliated of the glorious clothing and nice rings that she had had, all of it gone immediately. Instead, nakedness will be exposed to the nations. And God says very plainly here, I will take vengeance, I will spare no one. So he's very meticulous in the judgment here, and that's where we jump into verse 3 through that section. I will take vengeance and I will not spare a man. And then all of a sudden, verse 4 is there. And verse 4 kind of acts as a hinge between the first three verses, which I just spoke about, and verses 5 and 6, which describe 
exactly what's going to happen. In the middle of this, all of a sudden, we have an incredibly beautiful statement. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name. The Holy One of Israel. I just don't look at me for a second. Look at your Bible and look at that verse. I cannot wait to be redeemed from the Babylon we live in. I cannot wait to be set free forever from the alluring force of evil that is out and attacking every single one of us every single day. Amen? I can't wait. I can't wait for verse 4. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is His name, the Holy One of Israel. That verse 4 is like, when it's, once again, it's the door opening to what He's doing. Here I come. And what he does is he takes vengeance on Babylon for Israel's sake. Verse 5, sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the queen of kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I, I profaned my heritage and gave them into your hand. He's talking about them being led into exile to the Babylonians. You did not show mercy to them. On the aged, you made your yoke very heavy. So Babylon's sentence of judgment here is an act of vengeance by a sovereign God. It's not a twist of fate. This is not some sort of wheel of fortune turning against Babylon. Okay, which one are you going to get? No. No. It's a direct act of vengeance by God, the almighty God, the all-powerful God, the God of Israel, the God of the Jewish people. It's not by accident. And God's purpose concerning the whole Babylonian exile, he says, was to punish his people for their sins. They had sinned. They had violated the covenant between them and God. They had gone after other gods, and so God used Babylon to punish them for a very specific reason. Their, their rebellion, their idolatry. What is happening in our world and where we live today? Wouldn't you agree, as we've been saying over the last few weeks, look at the rebellion against God in this world. Look at the idolatry where we place everything above God. And brought, God brought in Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians. He was angry with his people. They came in, and then they desecrated his inheritance. They came to the city of God, Jerusalem, called Zion in the Old Testament. They destroyed it. They destroyed the wall even more. They went to the heart the religious heart of the city, the temple, Solomon's temple, and they destroyed it completely. They took whatever was valuable and they destroyed it. Psalm 74 pictures this. Your foes roared in the place where you met with us. They set up their standards as signs. They behaved like men wielding axes to cut through a thicket of trees. They smashed all the carved paneling with their axes and hatchets. They burned your sanctuary to the ground. They defiled the dwelling place of your name. They, they went through and destroyed God's inheritance. Desecrated it. They went too far. Well, how did they go too far? They were doing the very thing that God sent them to do, but they made two errors. First of all, they didn't do it for the glory of God and the honor of his name. Of course, they were pagans who Habakkuk said worshipped and sacrificed their own military. So they had no zeal for the glory of God at all. So that's number one. Number two, they went too far in the terms of oppression, harshness. Verse 6, you showed them no mercy. Even the aged, you, you laid this heavy yoke. And actually, if... 
you know this, you can look over to Daniel chapter 4 if you don't. This is the very thing that the prophet Daniel confronted Nebuchadnezzar about. In Daniel chapter 4, when Nebuchadnezzar had this terrifying dream, and he thought the dream was about him, and it was, and that God was going to judge him, Daniel, who I really believe cared for Nebuchadnezzar, said, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your wickedness by doing what is just and right and renounce your evil intent by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. This is the very thing that Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian system was doing. They were the crushing the people of God, grinding them to a powder. And so they were doing this, and in light of that, this arrogant security that they were in comes to an end, starting in verse 7. Yet you said, I will be queen forever. So all of this is going on. God said, okay, you're toast. You're toast. And what does Babylon say? Well, I'll be queen forever. These things you did not consider nor remember the outcome of, of them. Verse 8, Now then, hear this, you sensual one who dwells secretly, who says in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. I will not sit as a widow nor loss of children, but these two things will come on you suddenly in one day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come on you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries, in spite of the great power of your spells. You felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. Your wisdom, your knowledge, they have deluded you. For you have said in your heart, I am and there is no one beside me. But evil will come on you, which you will not know how to charm away. And disaster will fall on you for which you cannot atone and destruction about which you do not know will come on you suddenly we have this picture through these verses here of this arrogant security that babylon has the image shifts from that pampered virgin daughter to that of a spoiled arrogant complacent queen queen of the babylon babylonians kind of boasting, oh, I'm going to, not kind of, doing it. I'm going to live forever, eternal. And it is so easy for us, everyone, to forget that we are dust. And to dust we return. Someday, unless the Lord returns beforehand, we all die physically. Hebrews 9, it's appointed to each one of us to die once and after that to face judgment. And this statement, I will continue forever. There are people trying to build little nanocomputers to input into your brain. Why? I will continue forever. But it's I will continue forever without God. Right? It's amazing how things don't change. The technology is dif different. But you, you see that. Prosperity, ease and luxury is what she knew and she thought, well, just keep going on forever and ever. And we forget that, no. What has every empire done in the history of this planet? Rise and fall. I'm falling. And they make two boasts in here. No one sees me. Verse 10. Take a look at that again. You felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. 
No one sees me. She's doing dark, secret, wicked things, things at night, things in, that are hidden, things in her cellar, things in her bedchamber. That sounds like what people do today. Hidden, dark, ugly junk. And because no human eye can see that at the time, she thinks, well, I'm secure. No one knows what I'm doing, but she forgets there is one who sees all. Jeremiah 23, 24, can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. So that's the first thing. No one sees me. Second outlandish boast. And this one is a biggie. I am. Do we need to explain that? <laughs> well, let's do anyway for those that are inquiring minds that may not quite understand that. That is God's special message to the human race. God's and God's alone. When Moses said, what is your name? He said, I am. He is eternally self-existent. He is God. Everything else, including me, including you, derives its existence from God. You exist because God made you. And Babylon is saying, I am. I am. And there's none like me. Babylon's claiming to be God. Which is, you would think, an amazing statement, except what do people do today? You know, we, we share different stories and different things about people and their power crazy levels that they get in their hearts, weird levels that you actually think can't be true but are, and people think they're God. There's a gentleman a few years ago, about four years ago, decided to leave his laptop in a place that eventually would be found, and he wrote this, all those fears you think that I have of people not liking me or that I don't love myself, I don't fear that. You know why I don't fear that? Because the man I most admire in the world, that God to me thinks I'm a God. Recorded December 3rd, 2018, Hunter Biden. That's what people think. I wonder how many people are upset with me now. <laughs> totally okay with that. <laughs> but that's what people think. This is the kind of commitment to self that places you in the seat of saying, I am. Babylon had reached that level. Do you think the majority of the people around us have reached that level in their lives it's pretty wild but it's true and what goes along with that widowhood and loss of children but she's like nah i'm gonna be secure i got the army behind me i've got a warrior husband the army that has won every battle so far so i'm going to be secure but the young men die, children die, the, Bob, the Babylonian population crumbles, and the remnant is left to flee for their lives, and that's all history. And, and it goes on to explain, you know, hey, the occultic powers that you've been messing with are, are not going to save you either. 
Verse 12, stand fast now in your spells and your many sorceries with which you've labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you may cause trembling. You are wearied with your many counsels. Let now the astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moons, stand up and save you from what will come upon you. God's like, go ahead. Yeah, horoscope, see how that works. Behold, they have become like stubble. Fire burns them. They cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There will be no coal to warm by, nor, nor a fire to sit before. So have those become to you with whom you have labored, who have trafficked with you from your youth. Each has wandered in his own way. There is none to save you. Isaiah, Isaiah is seeing here that the, their religion and their businesses are failing when they need it the most. You're wearied with your many councils. So what happens is the Babylonian culture goes into a meltdown. The society goes into a meltdown and there's all these proposals offered as the answer that God is saying, oh, you're going to try this, you're going to try this, you're going to try this, you're going to try this. But each one only makes the situation worse. And it's actually what we see today in our world, the exhaustion of our culture under the weight of one failed remedy after another. People keep trying to find a remedy to have peace in this world. We'll define peace later. Have peace in this world. But all of these remedies are not of God. It's the same thing that we see here. And these remedies that are not of God, what do they do? They just weight down the problem even more. T.S. Eliot said it this way, this is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. Keep trying to do our own thing without God. Keep trying to do our own thing without God. And people just get weighted down. I'm, not, you know, I'm talking about individuals. I'm talking about families. I'm talking about neighborhoods. I'm talking about cities. And I'm talking about nations. Those idols, as we've been mentioning over the last few weeks, they, they destroy the way we think. However sophisticated our Christ-denying ideas may be, what do they do? They weigh us down. And that's why Scripture says we should never be ashamed of the gospel. Many gifted people don't respect the gospel. Many gifted people do not understand it because they've never experienced the gospel. The gospel remains the power for God for salvation to everyone who believes and even believers who've only begun to explore its life-giving potentials today. And this is the beauty of the gospel. You can be sitting here today for the first time ever hearing of God and hearing of Jesus Christ who is the mediator between us and God and hearing that as we did in communion understanding that Jesus died for us, took on our sins as the one holy God-man. And he went on the cross and he took our sins. He redeemed us. He sanctified us. He justified us. And that one act did it all. And that, this is what's so wild about this and we've had discussions about this at different times in different classes and different things when people have said I you know I know I remember when I decided yeah I, I believe and there's some of us that was more of a gradual thing and so we can pretty much kind of give you a you know I was maybe in fourth grade when that the light went on But the beautiful thing is that in this room today, someone can go, you know what, I believe. And they are saved 
just as much as the rest of us. They are saved. Jesus is like, welcome. And that blows my mind. And the weight of the world is what? Gone. Because those remedies didn't work. They never do. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Isaiah's last line there there's, puts it bluntly, there's no one that's going to save you. Translated really uh, in another way in the Hebrew that I actually like this translation better. Isaiah says to Babylon, hey guys, your Savior doesn't exist. We need to be saved. Every one of us is trusting in some Savior or another. And we need to ponder what Isaiah says there. Does your Savior exist? What is your Savior really doing? Will your Savior last? Does anything about you deserve to? And the answer is no, I'm a sinner. But Jesus says, yes, you do deserve to stay forever and ever in my presence because I have saved you. If you define yourself by idols, you're going to become as fake as they are. You catch that? If you define yourself by the idols in your life, you will become as fake as those idols. But there is one real Savior. He has no standing in the eyes of this present age. But what he offers, as he says in Matthew 11, 11, come to me. All of you who are heavy laden, You catch where all this is going? All of you who are heavy laden, what does he say? I will give you rest. Another statement that we need to rest on, literally. No one has ever come to Jesus and believed in him and not been saved. 100%. If you're his, it's 100%. So that's Isaiah 47. Application points once again. We need to be looking at this world by the lens of faith, faith in Christ. And when we see that, we see darkness that's out there and we see the light of God. We see the powers that are at war. We see the idols that are fake. And we see the one true God. We live in a world that's dominated by the spirit of Babylon, right? Judgment is coming. We know that. Idolatry, sins, things that you do in secret, and all of the ways you've capitulated to the world system, all of those things, if you are not a Christian, you have been storing up what against yourself? Wrath. Does anyone like talking about that? No. But that is what we see in chapter 47 here. That's what we see in this day There will be righteous judgment and it will be revealed when Christ returns for his second advent. So what do we do? Verse 4. We flee to Christ. We flee to the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the universe, lived a sinless life, never yielded 
to Satan's temptations, didn't bow down and worship him, had nothing to do with the spirit of Babylon. In fact, he will be the destroyer of that spirit, and he has come to save. Save you. Flee to him. Trust in him. Believe in him. Find forgiveness in him. And don't be complacent. Because this is the word of encouragement once again. Someday the darkness is gone. Amen? Isn't that going to be awesome? Someday we're going to come out forever from Babylon. And there will be no weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be no tears. There will be no fear. Babylon will not have a magnetic pull on all of us because it won't exist. It will be cast into hell. And then what do we have? Well, what the angel said. We'll have peace. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. Because Jesus came, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose again, went to heaven, and soon he returns to bring us home. The God of peace will then crush Satan under our feet. You guys have heard this story from me before, but if you are here for the first time, it's one of my favorite things that's happened in my life. Many of you know that I love music, and I love picking out the worship music for our church. Um, there's just times when I'll hear a song for the first time, and I'll just go, yeah, we're going to sing that. And, and it's pretty cool. And that's been something that I've had the joy of doing now for about 30 years. And it all first started with leading a little ragtag group of junior hires and high schoolers up in Washington State. Yeah, I know some music, but playing trumpet isn't exactly conducive to leading the worship team at a church. <laughs> Everyone sing with me. Anyway. But there's just some songs that you remember forever and ever, right? You got, you got your list. Mine's better. <laughs> right? That's kind of where we're at with that. And Man, I stumbled across a song, and uh, my favorite songs really are scripture songs, because it's the way I remember scripture the best in memorizing it. And so it was a scripture song, it was Romans 16, 19, you know, for the God of peace will soon crush Satan you know, underneath your feet. Be excellent in what is good. Be innocent of what is evil. And I heard this song, and it's not a song we will do here. Trust me, it doesn't quite fit all of our demographics. But it was perfect for junior hires and high schoolers and me because I was basically the same age. <laughs> and we had maybe, I don't know, a few hundred teens that would meet every Wednesday night together, and um, there were a few songs then. We sing one of them now, um, even uh, every once in a while here. But this one, when I first heard it, I was like, I think this will be pretty cool uh, for our, our, our teenagers to remember what God will do, what, what God will do in their lives. And so we started singing it, and, you know, the, the, the song kind of shouts more than, than uh, sings for most of it. <laughs> and, 
You know, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan, will crush Satan underneath your feet, and has this big boom, you know, with the song after that. And so we start learning it, we start singing it, and all of a sudden, I know it was like the second or third time that we, we sang it as, as a ministry, all of a sudden, and uh, if you want to grab that chair for me, I'm going I'm to attempt to bring, it, bring this chair up here. He's like, oh no. And I'm not, trust me, I'm not going to do anything weird. But anyway, so we had almost exact same types of chairs at, at the church there. So we didn't have pews or anything like that. Big, big auditorium, few hundred kids. All of a sudden, one of the days, the, one of the seniors in high school that was in the leadership group, during that part of the song, got up on the chair. And I was like, I, I don't think we can do that. Is the senior pastor around? No? Okay, we'll see what happens. And he was a leader. And you know what happens when someone's a leader? There's a bunch of followers. And so he get, all of a sudden, there's like a hundred some odd kids. And I don't think any of them knew what the next thing was. They're just on the chairs. Jenny, you remember this? And they're just getting on the chairs. And trust me, I'm not going to do this because I do know my age. And I'd rather not go to the hospital. Um, the God of peace will soon crush Satan, crush Satan underneath your feet. And all of a sudden, there is a hundred plus junior hires and high schoolers that did flying leaps off these chairs and crush Satan underneath their feet <laughs> is one of the best memories I have of that. And the reason is they were living out the excitement of what God is going to do. I still have random youth group kids 30 years later that talk about that. Hey, remember that song? I, I can't do that anymore. I'm like, me neither can I. But I can still go like this. And so when you look at a section of scripture like this, when you look at it in light of the first advent of Christ as we celebrate where Jesus comes and as a little baby that no one in their right mind would have thought was going to conquer all of sin. Except the angels knew. They're like, oh boy, these guys don't know what's coming. But the, we'll tell them. The Lord's come. Peace is going to come to earth. There's only one way peace can come to earth. Evil has to be destroyed. And that's what that little baby did for all of us. And eventually, when he comes back again on that horse with his name tattooed on his side, it's like, it's time to crush stuff. And he's crushing evil, and he's taking us home. Depending on your theology, it could be taking us home, then crushing, whatever. <laughs> but you know what I mean? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. Can everyone say amen and stomp once? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to look, dive into your word, dig deep, and understand the battle that is on, the weight of the idols that we allow into our lives, and the release from all of that that is found in you and you alone. 
Lord, I pray right now, if there's anyone here today that needs to talk about what that looks like, how do I navigate this, I want to know how to accept Christ. Lord, I pray that they'll snag Daniel, myself, and we'll just start that conversation. Lord, I pray that all of us today will leave here remembering that we are strangers in a foreign land, but we have a mission. And our mission is to let people know that Jesus alone brings peace. As verse 4 says here, He is the Redeemer. He is the Holy One of Israel. Thank you, Lord, for giving us Him. And may we be your people and look forward to the day when Satan is crushed underneath our feet. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today, everyone. Hope to see you Thursday night for our carol sing and potluck at 7 o'clock. And we hopefully will see all of you back next Sunday. God bless.